Also, my, March the 3rd is Feast of First Fruits. That day you want to bring a brunch item. We're going to talk a little bit more about it next week and the week after. It's our one time of year. We give to God ahead of time to thank Him for what He's going to do. Now, last year we gave ahead of time, and God blessed it with a van. This morning, where's oh, Connie's in the nursery? Connie came out and says, There was almost not enough room on the van again this morning. I'm like, That's a good problem to have. Amen? Is that not a good problem to have? And we've been seeing many people come and get saved through that ministry. Thank you for giving to that. And we're going to be talking about what we're going to be doing, what God leading in my heart this year. I have sent a letter out. You'll probably get it on Monday or Tuesday. Maybe some of you got it yesterday. Um, we just got our new copier back in place so we can mail stuff again. Uh, but we're looking for that and, and hear the heart that God has been speaking to me this year about our Feast of First Fruits. It's the only time of year we take a special offering um, uh, specifically for something. So it's going on there. And then next up, this is our web page. If you go to our web page, and right in the middle of our web page, we now at the top, we have our pictures, and then we have these three buttons. Uh, where's Kyle? Kyle, where are you? Next week, we're going to do it. I want you to do on, the, on announcements do an illustration of how this actually works. Okay, great. You remember this, right? We'll talk on Tuesday. All right, all right, very good. But we have three buttons here. I want to thank Josh Greenblatt and his staff to do a wonderful job on our website. We have a lot of great things on our website. Uh, right, we have on our about page, all this, the thing we have on the walls that talks about what our church is about. You can read it there. But we also have things here. If you say, what, what's our church like? You can click on this button, and the last 10 or 12 sermons pop up, and they can watch whatever they want. And, and they get to see what's going on. If you miss something, you can go right here. It takes you right to our YouTube channel. Also, our illumination groups. Every Monday night, we have a class. And some ask, hey, where can I find a class, and where is this? And sometimes it's hard to find them all on Facebook because you got to scroll down. They are now all here. You push the button here. Every class comes up categorized. If you want to find my class, right on the money because you love me. <laughs> but you want to find out about that or the evangelism class or Acts class or Ron Byers. They're all here. A new one's going to be coming very shortly, uh, Becky. Uh, Becky Erickchuk just taped her first class, right? The first one, right? Uh, on Christianity 101, is that what we're calling it? Christianity 101. So if you're a new Christian, it's going to be, hopeful. I think we're going to publish it this week. So uh, we're going to be having that here. And my Monday night at 6, uh, Monday night at 6.30, I post, or 6 o'clock, we post a blog. Uh, I do a one-minute uh, thing about something in the news, a current event, and put a Christian spin on it. Takes a, it takes less than a minute because Instagram only allows me one minute. That's it. That's all we're allowed to do on there. And so it's a really quick snippet every Monday night. Night we post one. And if you're wondering how to get to our website, uh, it's still, we, we have three addresses. We kept the first assembly address. So if you're used to going there, you can go there that way. But you can also tell your friends, these we have these two addresses, nbchurchpunksy, either .com or .org. We decide to buy both addresses. That way it makes it real easy for people to find us. So that, is it com, is it org? No, we got com and we got org. So, so nbchurchpunksy.com or .org. So we wanted just to publicize that and tell your friends and put it online. Thank you so much for that. And then one last thing is May the 1st. I'm giving you plenty of time. If you work on Wednesday night, May the 1st, start asking off tonight. That we will run the van that night. If Rob, you can't make it, I'll make sure I'll drive it out. We're going to have it. You're going to want to be here that night. Uh, I've been praying about something and I want something to happen and... and uh, Something amazing is going to happen that night. I, I, I want to tell you now, but I'm going to tell you on, the, on, on 24th that we talk about the, the, the state of the church and what's going to be happening this year. It's, put it this way, we will never have as big a Wednesday night crowd as we will have this, that Wednesday night on May the 1st. So make sure you come and you come early. We'll have food before time. I'm thinking about doing Subway sandwiches and that. So come on out. Don't worry about dinner. You're going to be blessed. It's going to be an amazing, an amazing night. I really want to tell you about it now, but I'm waiting to the state of the church address. Yeah, some, there are a few people who know what's going on and you're not allowed to tell anybody okay all right nobody talk to Susie all right so just let you know she's already told me she can't she can't keep a secret I'm, it's a test for her so uh so all right uh, uh, she's downstairs in children's church so I can pick on her right now <clears throat> so <clears throat> we have a lot of things going on but you're going to be blessed it's going to it's really going to propel us and it's amazing it fits right in with our three-year vision what's happening it's just unbelievable what's going to be happening all right we're going to continue our series today decisions 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 choosing God's path and sticking to it <clears throat> last week we finished our questions to ask this week and next week, we're going to talk about the principles that we should apply to our decision-making process. And then hopefully next week, also give you a quick seven-step guide you can write down 
We're just going to go boom, 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 boom through all seven. They help you always make the right decision the first time, not to go back and repeat something over and over and over again, which we tend to do in our Christian walk. And we don't want to do that. And, uh, but you know what? This week as I was reading, uh, I was reading uh, Time magazine, I read that occasionally just so I can get some different things for my vlog, and I came across an article, and it talked about emergency funds and why I should have one. Well, you know what? I teach a class called Right on the Money, and I believe that's one of the things you should have in your budget is an emergency fund because there's always going to be things that happen that are unexpected. You should prepare for the unexpected, and it doesn't have to be a giant fund. So I wanted to see what the article was about. When I read the article, I realized why we really, as Christians, got to understand what our decisions are like. Because our world is really going crazy. So I want to talk about an article. This is not the article. I really I, I couldn't find a picture of the article. Isn't that cute? This baby could live to be 142 years old. Wow. They're talking about modern medicine. I, I, I don't know if I want to be 142. I, I really don't know what the quality of life will be at 142 years old. But, uh, but the article reads this. This is how the article starts out. I'm going to read directly from the article. You're always being told to be proactive when it comes to protecting yourself financially for the future. I absolutely agree with that. Investment advisors suggest siphoning earnings into company match 401ks from the moment you start your first job, as well as opening college accounts for your offspring months before that dependent is even born. Those are good advice. With Americans carrying on average more than $8,000 of credit card debt and their 37000 student loan debt, advice like be sure you have an emergency fund makes perfect sense in order to avoid bankruptcy in case of a surprise job layoff, major life change like divorce or illness, or loss of a key resource like your home or car. This article is targeted for the millennial generation, 18 to 40-year-olds in that range. Okay, and from the article, here's the next paragraph. But one event to prepare for is the very real possibility of needing an emergency fund for an abortion. Despite the fact that 45% of all pregnancies in the U.S. are unplanned. It goes on to say, while not everyone faced with an unexpected pregnancy will choose to get an abortion, it is an unavoidable fact that for many people giving birth, it is too much of a financial, physical, and emotional burden at, point their, at this point in their lives, making abortion a safe and constitutionally guaranteed option. Let me tell you first, there is no such thing as an unplanned pregnancy. Unless you failed health class... When a man and a woman get together and they have this act, there is always the possibility that a baby could be the result. Now, they are talking in this article about people who want to go out and have fun and not have any responsibility or have any consequence and not have to make any choices. This next statement I'm going to make you need to not stop at the third word that I'm saying. All right? Are you ready? I am pro-choice. Now, you might be gasping, but let me explain. For me, I am pro-choice, but it's when the choice happens. I want to tell you right now, the choice was already made before anything happened. If you don't want to have a baby, don't have sex. Simple. Amen. All right? Yes, it's a wonderful thing. It's something that God gave us to enjoy, okay? But if you're going to do it, realize a baby can be the result. And you made the choice, once you made up in your mind, to go have the act. The choice is not an after choice as far as I am concerned. No one can really say with a straight faith, oops, a baby happened. <laughs> See, you're laughing because it can't be said. Whoa, I don't know how this happened. Really? <laughs> really? Now, here's the real stomach turner in this article. It goes on to explain how expensive a baby is and how draining that expense can be and how life-altering it can be. And they say it's too much, so just make an emergency fund so you can make this consequence of their choice go away with money. They're reducing choices to amounts of money. 
They're not making people own up to what they decide to do. What they don't say in the article is what a joy a baby can bring, what experiences you can have, how a baby can actually add to your life, not take away from it. This article continues on and says how a baby between the ages of 18 and 30 will destroy your way of life. Wow. You know what that screams to me? Selfishness. What is this article saying? You do whatever you want. Don't worry about the consequences because you can save money and take care of it. I'm going to tell you something today. A baby is not a consequence. A baby are living miracles. We live in an entitled society that promotes this. It promotes a me society, me only. Problem is you already had the choice before you started. I have a question though. This miracle, what did this baby do to you? That you want to kill it. Why should you kill it in the name of convenience? They're telling millennials it's okay to go out and do whatever you want and just have enough money to take care of your mistake. Oh, another thing, baby is not a mistake. What will this lead to? One day you may decide your wife is not worth it anymore. We're getting close to that. In the 70s, this movie came out called Logan's Run. Anybody remember this movie? When it came out, everybody said, this will never happen. Let me tell you the gist of the movie. It's a domed city where people are living in it. And when you get to the age of 29, you have to go into a chamber when your hand turns red. I don't know why. It's, it's not a video. I don't know why it's moving. It's eerie. All right. But the movie, the concept is eerie. You go into this chamber, and they say, renew, 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 and these lasers destroy the people there, and they feel they're going to be reincarnated because the city can only handle such a population. And behind this entire city are seven old guys. Well, six old guys and a lady. And, uh, and the lady does all the talking. No, I'm, it just, it, but here's the deal. And they tell, and they bring this one guy in to go chase these people down and say, if you follow us, we'll let you, be, let you become old. We kill people at the age of 29 because it'll affect the ability of the city to keep our way of life the way we want it. Let me tell you something. We're not far from this. Under Obamacare, which I, there are pros to Obamacare. I help people get insurance to that. It's good. There's good things to it. But there's one thing. When you turn 70, you have mandatory death counseling now. You're supposed to decide whether or not you think your life will be worth it after age 75. You have to go through counseling and have that question asked to you. I don't know about you, I know a lot of 80 and 90 year olds that do a lot of good things. There's a beautiful painter called Grandma Moses who lived almost to be 100 years old. She's one of, the most, one of the most amazing American painters of all time and did her best work from the time she was 80 on. You know, who are you to say when life can end or can't end? I want to read this to you. In New York, state above us, there was just a speech by the governor to the Senate. And they gave a standing ovation to the notion of delivering a baby intended to be aborted, letting it live, and then killing it is okay. And they got a standing ovation. Just a few months ago, a quote from the governor of Virginia. If a mother is in labor, the infant will be delivered. The infant will be kept comfortable. The infant will be resuscitated. If that was the mother and the family desired, then a discussion would ensue between the physician and the mother if she wants to abort the baby after born. Six states have passed a law. They can do this. And what they want to do is they want to determine whether the child has any defects and whether it's worth financially to continue along with this child. That's a scary process. You know, if these laws were in effect 20 years, 60 years ago, one of the smartest men who ever lived, now I don't believe he's a Christian, but he just died recently. His name is Stephen Hawkins. Boy, he would have come into the world, oh, we're going to kill him. Life, all life, is precious. As Christians, we need to start taking our decision-making seriously. Why do people make these decisions? Because we do not take decision-making seriously in this country. We do things on a whim, and we don't go to the one who can help us make the right decision every time. And we need to do that so the world around us can see that the world does not have to be so confusing and scary. 
that there is hope, there is direction, there is someone who wants to talk to them to give them a future. We can no longer as Christians guess at how to live our lives. That hasn't done us a whole lot, has it? We need to know how to live our lives for the Lord. I hope you wrote down the eight questions we talked about as a guide. If not, go to the website and, hey, see them. This we're going to talk about a couple of principles and then seven steps. This is important for us. So one of the reasons people are so quick to make decisions about abortion is they miss this principle. Proverbs 18.13 says this. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. He who answers the matter before he hears it is folly and shame to him. The first principle you got to do with all the questions is, is you have to do what this. If you're going to make a good decision, get all the facts. Now, in the next words, the most important. First. How many times I've heard people say, if I had only known that, I would have made a different choice. Well, guess what? Who's, who's burden it is to find the facts? The person making the decision. You are. If we, we need to gather the facts, and we need, to add, we need to do that because if we don't have all the facts, we'll make a poor decision every single time. But you know why we don't always get all the facts? Because it's easier to act on what we know right now and not find out all the, all the facts. But then bad things happen. You know, one of the things you do in order to get all the facts is ask a lot of questions. Now, this picture is interesting. This picture is about a guy who is renting his plane out so you can fly around and do sightseeing with him. What question would you ask this guy, Ron, if you're going to go up with him? There's a thing fly. Very good. You see, the propeller is off the plane. This is a real advertisement. I would like to know why the propeller isn't attached for me to go up and fly with you. You know, because if you fly and it doesn't work, you know, the, the possibility of, of, of surviving a crash from a plane? About that much. Okay, very rarely do people survive it. I would like to ask this guy a whole lot of questions. Oh, yeah, I, did, I just put on two bolts and we go flying. Oh, I ain't getting in the plane. <laughs> we need to ask lots of questions before we make a decision. That's always okay. Now, some people say, you know, maybe our question is dumb. They're just saying out there, says there's no such thing as a dumb question, right? Actually, that's not true. There are dumb questions. I'm not going to lie to you. But you know what? To the person asking it, though, it's not dumb because they need their answer to that question. If someone asks you a question, you need to take it serious no matter what you think about it because apparently it's important to the person asking it. The only truly dumb questions, and dumb means, actually doesn't mean bad, it means silent. That's what the word dumb means can't talk. That's what it really means. So really, the only truly dumb questions are the ones that are not asked. What's the Bible say? You you have not because you what? Ask not. That doesn't mean everything you ask for God will give you, because sometimes what you ask for you really shouldn't get, but but he'll lead you to what you need because you're asking. He'll talk to you. But I'll tell you one thing, you'll never get anything from the Lord if you never ask. The next thing here is Proverbs 18, 17. The first one to plead his case seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. When you're going out and getting all the facts, you must remember that you need to go on a fact-finding mission. And when you're on that mission, that there are two sides to every story. If you look at it, see two both ways, sides both ways. It's not taught, it's two and two, okay? There's two sides to every single story. And sometimes, there's three. There's that story, there's that story, and then there's your own opinion. People that get abortions, when they go to a clinic, only hear one side. They don't tell them what the great part about life can be and how the baby can bless their life. And I worked in a lot of uh, pregnancy centers. When I was in Jacksonville, Florida, we had uh, one right next to us. The lady who ran it came to our church and just so you know, if you know anybody who's ever had an abortion, God forgives. The lady who ran the pregnancy center had an abortion, and then she ran a pregnancy center to help people not get abortions. And, uh, and they would have ladies all the time over there. Jacksonville's a giant city. 
And uh, we would help out every once in a while. And uh, one, one time they needed baby food to help parents, new p- parents with, with food. And so our church did a fundraiser, our children's church did. We had about 400 kids in our children's church, and I challenged them to bring in 2,000 jars of baby food. And if you do that, I'll, I'll let you dress me up in a baby outfit, put me in a giant high chair, and you can feed me baby food. They brought in 3,000 cans of baby food. I actually asked my wife to find a picture of this. This is before the Internet age and all that stuff, and, and we couldn't find it, praise the Lord. Um, it was quite an embarrassing picture because back then I weighed 350 pounds and they had this giant, like, we brought in this, like, life, lifeguard tower thing to ask as a crib. And, um, but, you know, we did actually want to help them out, show them there's another choice. Because so many ladies that came to the clinic had already had an abortion. But they don't tell you the abortion clinic is the remorse and the regret and the, 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 when the baby's gone, what you feel like. They don't give any help for that. And to hear the other side which is facts too. You need to hear both sides to make a proper decision. You know, many times in Christianity, we make bad decisions that harm our relationship with Jesus and others because we only listen to what? One side. Or sometimes no sides and just listen to ourselves. You know, we made up our minds and made a bad decision with a small set of facts and we didn't even ask Jesus. Now, many times we run to people and they say they've talked to Jesus about the problem. Okay? But there's a difference talking to Jesus and talking with Jesus. When you talk to somebody, you're doing all the talking, you don't really care what they have to say. When you're talking with somebody, that means there's a conversation going along. You know, the bad way to do this is if you go to a person and say, Jesus, I know what this person did. I know they're wrong. There's no way this can be right. I know what I think the Word of God says about this. Jesus, do something about this. I have a question. You know, you're, you're going to him, and what's he doing? Why should you expect Jesus to answer you? You know what he's going to do? He's going to be totally silent on the issue, and you're going to think that you're right. You could be right, but you won't know for sure, because why will Jesus have a conversation with you if you've already made up your mind about what the answer has to be? Like we talked about last week, if you're going to tell God, hey, if you want God to move in your life, you've got to be willing to do whatever he says. If you have a list of what I won't do, don't expect God to answer. We not to do that. When you say, when we go to Jesus and you say, hey, Jesus, this is what I think. Present your opinion. But then be open to say things like, hey, God, um, am I right? Is there something I'm missing? Is there something I don't know? Allow a conversation to happen. Because if you don't, God will not have the chance to bring other facts you might have missed or lead you to other facts or maybe even lead you to the facts. Really, we can all be wrong. I've been wrong. I've had to go apologize to people. I try to go bend it backwards to try to get every side of the story I can before I talk to somebody because it's necessary. It's what God asks us for, and God will respond to that because, you know, what? we need to do that because Proverbs 18, 19 is true. A brother offended is higher than the wind in a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. When we deal with people, because that's our number one job, right? We're supposed to go out and be dangerous, win people to Jesus. Our job, we're in the people business. And when you offend a brother or a sister or family member, husband, wife, aunt, uncle, grandma, co-worker, when someone gets offended, it's really hard to turn them back around. And so what God is saying, make sure you get all your facts right. Don't just go, I know what I'm talking about. I know so many Christians that do that. You know what? Unless you're God himself, you might not know everything. Uh, That's a joke. You, You don't know everything. No one knows everything. Ask God before you do something. And when you do ask God for all the facts and you're listening, make sure you pay attention to the facts. There's this story about in 1 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 18, it says, Jehoshaphat and Ahab. This story is Jehosh- Ahab wants to go to war. Now, Israel is not following the Lord. They're following the Baals and, and these idols. And they want to go to war. And Jehoshaphat, Ahab asked Jehoshaphat, come up and join me in this battle. So Jehoshaphat comes up. And he says, well, what, what, what should we go to bed? And they said, let's consult some people. And Ahab brings in all these, these prophets of Baal and things like this. And they say, go ahead. You're going to win the battle. No problem. You're going to crush them. No problem. And all this stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. And all of a sudden, you know what happened next? Ahab, uh, Jehoshaphat goes, he serves the Lord and says, isn't there a prophet of God in Israel? Can't we talk to the guy who talks to God? <clears throat> so they bring in a prophet of God, and, a- and Ahab goes, tell Jehoshaphat what we should do about this battle. And the guy says, yeah, go ahead, go, go fight, you'll win. 
kind of flippantly. And Ahab gets mad. I told you, never, ever, ever not tell me what the Lord says. Always tell me the truth. And Ahab tells Jehoshaphat, this guy always says bad things about me. That's why I know this is not right. <clears throat> and so the prophet prophesies again. He says, the Lord has told me if you go into battle like this, you're going to be killed. Like lambs before the shearer, before the slaughterhouse. Sorry, I need to grab a drink. I'm and you're going to be scattered all across the hillside. It's going to be a disastrous battle. Now here's the thing. They heard from the Lord. They heard from the other side. Jehoshaphat followed the Lord. And they had all the information they needed to make a decision. But you know what they did? They went and fought anyways. They didn't listen to the facts. They didn't pay attention because they had already what? Made up their minds. And what happens in the battle? Ahab dies, and Javashvat almost dies, and he has to cry out like a little girl to get saved, if you read the story. They should never have gone to battle in the first place. You know, if you're going to get advice, you're going to get all the facts together, actually use the facts you have and make a good decision. Next principle is this. Never make a decision under pressure or in a hurry. Let me emphasize that. Never make a decision under pressure or in a hurry. <clears throat> <clears throat> on TV, there's this guy, and his name's Mark Cuban. He owns the Dallas Mavericks. No, I, I do not think he loves the Lord. I can't say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, but you will know them by their fruits. He's on a show called Shark Tank. <clears throat> and all the sharks do this, what I'm about to tell you, but he's the first one that did it. And what happened was, is this entrepreneur would be up there, and they would offer part of the company for, let's say, 10%. Well, he came back with his offer. He said, I want to pay you this much, but I want 25%. And you have to decide right now. Don't listen to anybody else because I like decisive people. What's he doing? He's putting the entrepreneur, the business person, on the spot to make a decision right there and then. However, what you don't know about the show is even whatever deal is made on the show, the sharks, the business guys, they have time to go back and look at the company, do due diligence on it. And most of the deals that happen on TV don't actually happen because they find out it's not the deal they want to do. But yet, they want to make them make a choice right there and not listen to anybody else because I want somebody who is decisive. You know what? In the world, the devil wants to force us to make snap decisions. Sometimes your boss, sometimes your friends, sometimes your family wants you to make snap decisions. They use things like, it's a... Once in a lifetime deal, you'll have instant success. Oh, if you don't do it now, you're going to miss out. Or come on, we need to know now. Quit being a wimp. Let me tell you something. If someone's pushing to make a decision in a hurry, they're not looking after your best interests. And if they don't, if you don't do this, they say you're not decisive. But we want to be decisive. We want to be known as people who can make a decision and stand by it. The problem is, what does the word decisive mean? Well, wonderful dictionary. Let's look it up. Decisive means settling an issue, producing a definite and effective result. You notice what it doesn't say about decisive? It doesn't say you have to be quick about it. But the world teaches that, doesn't it? Now, it can also take too long, too. The key to being decisive is when you make a decision, you can stand behind it with no regrets. <clears throat> when someone wants you to be decisive quickly or pressuring you or hurrying you, they are not looking for interests. What they want to do is they want to control you. Because once you make a decision, if it's not the best decision for you, but for them, you just gave up control to the other person or to the devil or whatever is going on. You lose control in the scenario, and God does not want that for you. He wants you to help you make decisions you can live with and ones that make sense for you. When Jesus wants you to come to know him, he spends time wooing you. He spends time going after you. He doesn't want you to make a snap decision about Jesus. I, I tell it all the time. I say, hey, you want to have a relationship? Let me talk to you about it. He wants us to explain it because he wants people coming because you want to be part of that. You want to be, we advertise baptism for, for weeks because I want you to want to do it. You know, the different things that we have going on. But when we lose control, when we're hurried or pressured, and it can lead to disaster and almost always lead to regret. Daniel 6, 9 says this, Therefore King Darius signed the written decree. 
What happened in the first eight verses was there was this guy named Daniel who the king liked, but he loved the Lord above everything else, and he was set above all the other governors of, the, of Babylon. And the Babylonians who were there before Daniel didn't like Daniel at all. They wanted to kill him. So they came up with this wonderful idea, king. For 30 days, let's make a decree that no one can worship any other god, but they can only pray to you and worship you because you're such great. And they were what? Stroking the king's ego. It's only eight verses. I'm sure it went a whole lot longer than that in real life. And you know what they did? We need you to sign it now. Do it now. And they kept buttering him up. You know, if someone's buttering you up, you might want to ask why. Because if this is good for both of you, there shouldn't be no reason to butter the person up, right? And so the king signs the decree. And Daniel hears about it, continues to pray like he always does, and the Babylonian governors say, hey, there he is. He's praying. And the decree said anybody who was praying, caught praying, would be thrown to the lion's den. So they went back to the king in the next couple of verses and said, King, hey, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel, I like him. You got to kill him. What do you mean I got to kill him? You said, he prayed to his God out in the open. It says in verse 14, it says this. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with him, who? himself. When you, don't, when you don't get all the facts and you make decisions quickly, you only person you have the blame is himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and you know what he couldn't because he made a choice he made a decisive choice but did not bring really good results did it not because he couldn't undo it but that night Daniel prayed and God shut the lies of the, 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 the mouths of the lions and Daniel made it to the morning king was so relieved and he took the governors and put all them and their families in there and the lions weren't so nice to them if you want to find the whole story, read the rest of Daniel chapter 6. In this story, though, it worked out for the king. His, his, his decree, his decision didn't totally backfire on him. But the reason for it is because God was looking out for Daniel, not the king. That's the only reason it worked out. We need to be careful. Now, how long should it be? How long is it, is it be decisive? Let me tell you what the Bible says. It doesn't. All right, it doesn't say how long you have to wait to make a good decision. With Josh about earlier, well, he has another, later on, he has another part in his story where three armies come against him, and he is, don't know what to do. His captain of his army wants to surrender the white flag immediately. Josh says, we're going to make a fast. We're going to pray for days on end. And they did. They prayed and prayed for weeks. And then finally, the prophet of the Lord, Hazazio, came in and said, the Lord has answered your prayer. This is how you're going to win the battle. You're going to go fight them. But here's how you're going to do. You're going to put the singers first. They're going to sing, and God will deliver you. You want to fight a bit. And when he got that answer, he was decisive and made it happen. Now, I don't know if the singers like being in the front of the battle line. But it worked out, and they got there. Everybody was dead. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you're decisive. you got to do things that people don't always agree with. But if it's from the Lord, you'll know, you'll, have the, you'll know what's right. Another thing is Peter. Story of Peter in Acts chapter 10. And it was so unbelievable, Peter had to repeat it in Acts chapter 11 because no one believed him. And what happened is, is Peter was sunning himself on top of a house, and he fell asleep. And while he was asleep, he had a dream of this sheet coming down with animals in it that he wasn't supposed to eat. And a voice said, rise, Peter, kill and eat those things. And Peter said, no, I can't eat those. God says those are bad animals to eat. And then God says, do not call anything unclean that I call clean. Who are you to say that? Rise and kill me. This happened three times. And immediately it was done, three people showed up at the house and said, call for Peter to come preach to a guy named Cornelius. At this time, the apostles had only told other Jews about Jesus. They had not gone into the whole world. But Jesus' command was preach the gospel to all creation. The great, command, the, the great commission is go into all the world. But they hadn't done it yet. And so God had to make a point. And then Peter had to make a quick decision to go or not go with these people because these people were from the Roman centurion. Not just people who weren't Jews, but their mortal enemies who had conquered them. God was making a point. And what happened was is Peter immediately went down, went with them, went to Cornelius' house. 
Everybody who was there heard the word of God, got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, got their prayer language, got all the stuff they needed. And it was to show that, you know what? God is for every single person. But you know what? Peter had to make a quick decision there. So there is no real answer, but what is common, every decision making in the Bible that's right, is this. This is what is common. They have learned to hear the Holy Spirit. Hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And yes, I said hear him. He wants to talk to you. You know, in so many ways, we need to learn to hear his voice. It says in John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. When you get saved, we're not talking about tongues and that. That's another gift. But this, everybody has a spirit inside of them when they come to know Jesus Christ. And he wants to talk to you. The Spirit has all kinds of gifts, and one of them is to help guide you in this life. How? How do you ask him? It's real simple. Holy Spirit, help. It's that simple. Help me out. I need help. And dwell with him. Don't talk to the Holy Spirit, but dwell with the Holy Spirit. It takes time sometimes. Find your chair like we have here, or my blue chair in my house in different places. And it's okay. Simple rule. If you don't have a peace, then wait. God says, I'll give you a peace that passes understanding. If you don't got it, wait for it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit might not be stopping you from decision, but he might be telling you wait to get more facts so the decision will turn out even better for you. Why would you if you don't have a total peace about it? Ever heard of buyer's regret? Or remorse, I guess is the word, not regret. That's why it happens. And the more you do it, the better you will get at it. And you'll begin to recognize the Holy Spirit's voice more and more, and you'll be able to depend on Him, and you'll be able to make decisions faster and quicker. And the great thing is when you hear the Spirit's voice, and sometimes it'll be audible, sometimes it'll just be inside of you. Different play, God can speak in so many different ways, but you'll be able to make a decision that is decisive, that is for your benefit, that is effective, and you don't have to repeat the decision over and over and over again. God wants to avoid costly mistakes and do-overs in your life. And he's giving you help for that. So today, if the worship team can come forward, uh, Renda, Russ, I'd like to do that. I don't have the words for it second time, but they're pretty simple. And second here, we're going to have an altar call. And God is here. Our principles today about decisions, we need to start making good decisions. I gave you examples of some really bad decisions that are being made today, and they're being made because they're not getting the principles. They don't know how to make a good decision. They're making decisions without any facts, without any idea. They're making them in a hurry. Get all the facts first. Maybe you're here today. And you know what? And every Christian is different. But you know what? It's hard to always get all the facts first. <clears throat> a lot of times we make a decision and hope the facts work out. Boy, what a bad place to be, isn't it? If you're here today, I'm going to invite you to come forward to, 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 and say, God, I want you to help me. Because, you know, it's not easy. It's against our human nature to go figure everything out. We want to just go, go, go. We need to pray. <clears throat> we need to ask God. We need to see both sides of the story so we can make good decisions. Because once you make a bad one, it's really hard to fix, folks. It's not easy to fix bad decisions. Anybody tells you it's easy to fix it, they're, they're lying to you. Just think of people in your lives. I was at a church in, in Texas. This lady, her name was Susan, had two sons every week she prayed for. I had talked to each other for 35 years. Because they were in business together, and one made a decision, and the other made a decision. They didn't like each other's decision. They stopped talking. And in those 35 years, they both had between the two of them, I think, seven, grand, seven children. The cousins never saw each other. And 35 years later, they answered a prayer. The two brothers met and realized what they made a decision of years ago in their 20s was the dumbest thing they ever fought over. But the problem was they never, they never chose to see the other brother's point of view. And if they would have, they agreed they would never have had the rift they had, and they spent 35 years apart. You know, it happens in the churches. Why are there church splits? Why do people leave churches? Because people don't take the time to find all the facts. You know what? God wants you to have great relationships. He wants you to have great relationships with your boss, with your co-workers, with your family. But see, the devil's going to put some facts out there sometimes, and he'll use facts, just not all of the facts. 
to get you to <clears throat> go, hey, I know these are facts here, but they might not be all the facts. So today, if you're here today, do you want help with that? Because it's not easy to take a step back and try to get all the facts. I want you to come forward in a second and we start to sing. And the second thing today is, y'all was open for us. The second thing was, never make a decision under pressure in a hurry. It's okay to take a step back. The Holy Spirit in the Bible is called the comforter. I don't know about you, how many of you ever made a decision that you weren't comfortable with? Raise your hand. Those of you not raising your hand, good for you or you're not telling me the truth. <laughs> but here's the deal. The Holy Spirit's job is not just the gifts. It's not just the conviction, but he's also there to help guide us. He's called the comforter for a reason. He wants to bring you comfort. He wants to help you make good choices so you don't have that nagging feeling inside of you. He wants you to be what? Comfortable. And when are you comfortable? When you know you've made a decisive decision that is effective for you and for those around you. And how do you think I hear the Holy Spirit? Maybe they're here to say, I, I don't want to be uncomfortable anymore. Well, it takes you coming forward here today and say, God, I want to learn how to hear your Holy Spirit more. This is called asking. It's a simple thing. And I'm just going to pray. We're not going to do, we're not going to pray individually. I'm just going to pray over those up here. You know what, God, you're going to start to hear the Holy Spirit better. You know why? Because I believe in my God, and I believe those who ask for it, God always. He says, if you need wisdom, come and ask. And I give liberally. It's a good way to use the word liberally. Not normally, but that's a good sense for it. So as we sing this song, and you need help with one of those two things today, making sure you get all the facts, because it, it will lead to ruin in your life if you don't. Or you need... Uh, you get pressured too many times to make decisions or you need to hear the Holy Spirit more. You're just uncomfortable making a decision sometimes. Come and tell the Holy Spirit from here on out, I want you to speak to me. Let me hear your voice. Let me learn to hear that. You got to want it. So right now, Russ, go ahead and uh, sing as he sings. Just come join me at the altar here today. I want to feed him the words. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. I sing praises to your name, oh Lord, praises to your name. Year, one of our other concepts is we don't want anybody to go alone to the altar. Those in your seats, you know what it is to have the Holy Spirit in your life. You know what it is to make good decisions, how important that is. Before I pray, I'd just like you to come up and find somebody and 
Just stand behind them. If we could just move and do that. Anybody has felt need, to just come up here and pray with those around. Just to, just to stand behind them. We want to stand with each other. We are family, are we not? So I want to invite people to come and stand with those. So those at the altar, you just move up a little bit so people can come and stand with you. They're standing with you because they love you. And when you're done, we're done praying, you're going to look at each other and say, hey, this is somebody that can help you. We're a family. We're in this together. Okay, keep moving up so everybody can get in. Lloyd, keep coming up forward. Go this way so people can get somebody behind them. We can't just say we're family. We have to actually be family. There's a couple people over here that need somebody. There's a couple over here that need somebody. Remember, there's no power in the elder. The power is in the obedience to do what God asks. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for all these that came forward and say, God, I want help getting into all the facts so I can make bad decisions that don't bring harm to me, but bring glory to you, Lord, and by virtue also bring glory to what's happening in my life. Blessings. And we pray for those up here today and say, Lord, I need to hear your Holy Spirit more. I don't want to be hurried or pressured. I want God me to come down and help me in those situations and be with them. And I believe, Lord, you're going to start that today, Lord. Because, Lord, you want to help us make the best decisions we can. Bless us today. And everybody said, amen. Before we leave, I have one last thing to say about decisions. <clears throat> I forgot to say it in my closing point. <clears throat> Sometimes there will be a moments when you do have to make a decision right away. Like I said, the Bible doesn't say how long it is to be decisive. He says we need to be decisive. The only way to do that is to know that we're making the right choice. If you truly seek out the Holy Spirit, you'll bring comfort there. You know what? He is not bound by time. I can tell you so many times in my life as a pastor, sometimes i got to make split decisions. But you know what? I'll ask the Holy Spirit. I'll start praying. And all of a sudden, it seems like time stands still. You know what? It can. There's two verses in the Bible about God holding back time for things to happen. God is the God of everything, including time. If you're in that place, reach out to the Holy Spirit. If you have your prayer language, pray in that. The person you're talking to might think you're nuts. But you know what? I'd rather them think you're nuts and you make a good decision rather than you make a bad decision and then worry about it later on in life. But ask the Holy Spirit, help me right now. And he, yeah, he can make time stop, for lack of a better term. I've had that happen in my life. But the only way that happens is you've got to believe it. And you've got to say, God, I need that right now and then. And he'll show up. Try it. Because you know what? He wants only the best for you. But we can only get the best if we actually let God be in charge. Say, God, what's the right thing? And when you need that pressurized moment, you know what? Here's how you know it's God. The hurriedness and the pressure of the moment will fade away. I'm telling you, the Bible has verses after verses about that. Try it. Because here's the deal. When you're in the moment, it really doesn't matter what the other person wants. It's what you need from the Lord that matters. So do what you have to do to make the best choice every time. And you know what? You'll have a much blessed and better life. Have a great week. we got church tonight. The mission team are meeting in the cafe. We have chili today if you like chili. And have a great week, and we'll see you next week.